if you can keep your name off something, then essentially there's nothing to connect you to the crime you've committed. And that means you can spend as much as you like. So so essentially what Moneyland does for you is, is if, you, if you steal money and you want to spend it, before you spend it, you can hide it. Um, and you can hide your involvement in the in the crime. And that's the power of Moneyland. And, and that's the new aspect of all this, is that you've always been able to steal and spend, and you've always been able to steal and hide, but you weren't previously able to steal, hide, and spend all together. It's the, it's the sort of Moneyland pathway that's beggaring the world. That is award-winning investigative journalist Oliver Buller, and this is the All Things Risk podcast. Welcome back, or welcome to the All Things Risk podcast. My name is Ben Catanio. I'm your host. This is my show. This is where we tackle risk and uncertainty in many forms. The aim of what we're doing here is to try and help us all, myself included, embrace uncertainty and understand and tackle the biggest risks of our times. A Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays to you all wherever you are and however you celebrate. And before we get into the episode, a little bit of business as usual. We're brought to you by Audible, the home for audiobooks. And it's December the 24th. If you are stuck for a last minute Christmas gift, give the gift of Audible, where as a listener to the podcast, you can get a free first month or 30-day trial, which includes a free audiobook, which is yours to keep no matter what. If you are in the USA, simply go to audibletrial.com forward slash all things risk. Or if you're in the UK, go to the link in the show notes. Okay, today we are going to go on a little trip to a place called Moneyland, which is also the title of the Times of London's Business Book of the Year. It was written by our guest, Oliver Bullock. The full title is Moneyland, Why Thieves and Crooks Now Rule the World and How to Take It Back. Moneyland is a virtual place, but it is very real. It's where many of the world's mega rich, particularly kleptocrats in a variety of countries, can hide and spend their stolen wealth. And as you'll hear from Oliver, Moneyland is a lawless stateless country, but it is also the third richest country on earth. And it's one in which the West's own institutions have helped to create it and in the process undermine many of the foundations of Western stability. So who is Oliver? Oliver is an award-winning investigative journalist who previously wrote two nonfiction books about Russian history and politics, both of which were shortlisted for prizes. Moneyland is an incredibly important and timely book, and one in which Oliver's skills as an investigator and writer come through marvelously. And in this conversation, Oliver shares the origins of Moneyland, how Moneyland works, including how kleptocrats can steal, hide, and spend their wealth and do things like buy passports. We talk about tax havens and how they work. Oliver shares the role of the West in creating Moneyland and how it is now undermining democracy. And even though this is all a bit of a dark story, we end on some positives that Oliver gives us around what we can really do to take back control and to fight Moneyland. And it's somewhat appropriate that This episode goes out the day before Christmas because 27 years ago, on December the 25th, 1991, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. And that event, as you will hear, was an important prelude to the story of Moneyland. This is a fascinating and important big picture conversation. So let's go and meet Oliver Bulla and take a tour of Moneyland. Enjoy. The All Things Risk podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on, and I'm really looking forward to chatting about your your latest book, Moneyland. Welcome. Thanks for thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. So, for my listeners, Oliver, it'd be great if you could pen or give us an overview of your background and how you got into exploring all things kleptocrats and former Soviet Union and getting into journalism. I think that would be a great place to start. 
I'm I'm from Mid Wales, which is um, a relatively sparsely populated part of the UK. Um, uh, not the kind of place where high politics tends to happen, you could put it that way. And I grew up um, slightly obsessed by the comic Tintin comic books and mm. Tintin comic books. Uh, they're not they're not big in the state, and it, but they basically the adventures of a young journalist who who ran around the world a lot of the time in eastern europe uh, having adventures and generally solving crimes and never really filing any articles um and and i sort of suppose i i became slightly obsessed by eastern europe as a result of tintin i thought it just seemed like the most interesting place in the world and then uh, it became so you know in the in the 1980s and 90s everything was happening in in Hungary and the Czech and Czechoslovakia and Romania and then Russia, of course, Ukraine and so on. And that was sort of very much seemed like the cockpit of world history at the time. So as soon as I could, which is when I left school, I just sort of headed over there to check it out for myself. And um, and after a while, I began working as a um, as a journalist uh, in St. Petersburg in Russia to begin with, and then in Moscow. Uh, and and that was it. I, I was sort of became a Russianist sort of as a result of that, I, I, I learned language and stayed out there just because it was an interesting place to be. Um, and then if you spend any time in Russia, or, or in fact, almost any of the countries of the former Soviet Union, you start bumping up against kleptocracy. Mm. Um, and, and I suppose it was 2014, um, the revolution in Ukraine, which really crystallized for me the damage that this kind of egregious transnational corruption was doing to democracy and prosperity and, and in fact the, just the general prospects of, of whole generations of people in the former Soviet Union who had you know hoped in 1991 when communism collapsed they hoped that that their countries would build sort of prosperous you know liberal open societies and instead they'd built these kind of you know semi-dictatorships governed by crooks and and and, and that was you know why did that happen why was that and why did that happen why was that allowed to happen that essentially became you know, the thought process that led to Moneyland, which is the book, which, which has just come out. Right. Did you have this, this view? I certainly did when I, I think we're more or less contemporaries in, in, uh, when we went to university and, and, and this sort of thing, I, I had a view that, uh, very, was very similar to Francis Fukuyama's end of history, that liberal democracy is going to slowly take over. And I think most, much of the world did at that time. Did you go into your profession thinking that? And uh, did you, was some of your uh, thoughts that crystallized in 2014, did you start to uh, earlier see indications that maybe this part of the world isn't going to follow the path of Western liberal democracy? Well, I mean, I suppose so. I mean, I, I didn't really overthink things as a rule. I was, mm -hmm. I was along along for the ride, but um, but you know, I had spent quite a lot of time before I went to Russia in places like Romania and Hungary and and um, uh, the Baltic, the Balkan countries. And I suppose in those places, you know, democracy was catching on. You know, things were becoming more prosperous. Change was happening. Yeah, you know, they were inching towards joining the EU, and you know, so. So it did feel like that 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 the world and that that part of the world was getting better. Um, so I suppose after I moved to Russia, it took me a while to realise that Russia had a different trajectory, um, and and that in fact, you know, that the the betrayal of the hopes of a generation of Russians had been not just you know sort of as it were not just a, a kind of running counter to that, you know, Francis Fukuyama theory that liberal democracy was going to triumph, but had actually, this betrayal had been had been conducted with the active assistance of many Westerners. You know, it wasn't just Westerners were standing by wringing their hands in dismay, dismay, but, you know, Western countries, Western institutions, Western individuals had been helping the crooks and the kleptocrats to steal their money, to launder it and to spend it in our, our countries. Um, so it, it, it isn't just that, you know, that that thesis of, you know, is wrong, you know, that liberal democracy isn't the natural endpoint that we all end up at. But actually, liberal democracies and the, and the citizens of liberal democracies have been actively helping it to, 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 to go wrong. Um, so I, th I mean, that's the sort of the core argument I make in Moneyland, really, that that these crooks, and I'm thinking about people like, you know, Viktor Yanukovych, the former president of Ukraine, of course, and, and others like him, 
that they weren't just stealing money from their own countries, you know, in their own native genius. They were stealing money from their countries and hiding it using the sort of highly skilled intermediaries from London, from New York, from Los Angeles, from San Francisco, from Geneva, from wherever, Zurich. You know, the, 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 there was a, a whole sort of body of Westerners who were happy to hold their noses and just take the money um, and, and have been doing so and have got vastly wealth while, wealthy while doing so. And it's been hugely damaging you know, to places like Ukraine or Russia, you know, if you just look at sort of health statistics, uh, you know, mortality statistics, you know, just living standards, all of these things have been, have been, you know, stagnating essentially because so much money has been stolen that their governments are, you know, ramshackle, really, you know, not doing the jobs they're supposed to be doing, but instead making people's lives miserable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you, you describe it so, so well. And I just, I love the term money land because it, it 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 just it encapsulates it in it, it, perfectly. But it, it'd be great if you could you just describe what you mean by money land. These people, these kleptocrats, live in money land. What is money land? Well, money land came to me as an idea in, in 2014 when I was exploring one of Viktor Yanukovych's residences. Um, this isn't a residence he had as president of Ukraine. This is a residence he'd built for himself with money he'd stolen on land that he'd stolen. And it was kind of a pleasure garden in the middle of a forest, a gorgeous place, um, you know, with a yacht harbour and a, a shooting range, a duck, a duck lake, a, a, you know, a huge sort of hunting lodge, massive outdoor barbecue area. It was really extraordinary. Um, and, and I'd wandered around this and sort of checked out the heated massage table and the plunge pool and all the kind of amenities. And, and, um, and I said to, to Anton, who's a friend of mine, who's a, who's a revolutionary, I said, you know, how, you know, how could you have let this happen? How did you let him get away with this? And Anton, he sort of slightly exploded at me. And as far as he ever does, he's a fairly chilled guy. And he just said, listen, we didn't know this was here. We didn't know any of this. You've you got to understand how, how well this was hidden. This land, it, it was in England. You know, it's not in Ukraine at all. And what he meant was that the, 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 the property the, the you know this hunting lodge was built on was owned by an offshore company in the UK and then that UK company was owned by another UK company and that was owned by a company in Liechtenstein or a foundation in Liechtenstein and so essentially in legal terms this place wasn't really in Ukraine at all it was somewhere else mm. and and the whole Ukrainian elite were doing this it wasn't just the president or the, or the ministers the you know the lawmen the, the oligarchs they were all keeping all of their property offshore in this way but the, but the thing about offshore is it's this is it's this term that, that we use a lot, but we don't really understand because it doesn't you think of offshore and you think of, I don't know, somewhere in the Caribbean with white beaches and palm trees and so on. You know, that's or you think maybe Monaco, you know, something like that. You think, well, if it's not offshore, then it's not here, then it's there. But it isn't there either. The property isn't anywhere. Offshore just means somewhere else. And um, so I wanted to to find a way to understand understand this and that's when i came up with the idea of money land because i said well this this property this hunting lodge it's not in ukraine and it's not in britain and it's not in Liechtenstein. it's in money land and once you start thinking about the world like that if you look at the amount of of property which is held elsewhere offshore which is just not where it's supposed to be you know it's somewhere between eight and ten percent of all the money in the world which which makes money land the third richest country on earth after the, um, the united states and china um and, you know, and that is a profoundly troubling thought, the idea that, that there is this sort of, you know, huge store of wealth, which is totally unaccountable, which is totally anonymous, which is out there, it, it, you know, and it's like a sort of malevolent poltergeist, you know, it's, it, we can't see it, we can't touch it, we don't know where it is, but it can see us and it can touch us, so it can interfere in, in the rest of the world mm -hmm. as, as freely as it likes to, but we can't interfere with it, with it. and that makes it a real challenge to the nature of democracy. You know, the core function of a democratic government is to tax the wealth of its citizens for the common good of everyone. Um, if you can't do that because money is anonymously held offshore, then then you're not really a democracy anymore. And, and you know, and this is a real challenge to the liberal order and a challenge that does not get anything like the recognition it needs to have. Mm -hmm. How many people would you say live in Moneyland? Well, I mean, it's 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 impossible to put a number mm. on it in terms of individuals, um, mm. you know, because it isn't it isn't just a function of being rich. There are plenty of people who, who are rich and don't live in money land. I mean, an obvious example here in the UK is someone like J.K. Rowling, mm -hmm. who pays all of her taxes, who keeps all her money on shore and so on. It's a function of being both rich and unscrupulous. Mm -hmm. If you if you're 
if you're rich and you don't want to, to either have the origin of your wealth examined because you've stolen it or you don't want to pay taxes on your wealth uh, because you just don't like paying taxes or whatever, that's what makes you a money lender. It's the, it's the combination of being rich and unscrupulous. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing we do know is that the number of people is increasing all the time. Um, the amount of money that is stolen from the world's poorest countries and stashed in money land is estimated by Global Financial Integrity, which is a watch uh, a think tank based in Washington, D.C., is estimated at more than one trillion dollars a year. Wow. Um, and a trillion, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to get your head around some of these numbers, trillion, billion, million, what the difference between them all is. But if, if you had a trillion dollars in dollar bills, if you were to count them, you know, one at a time, one a second till you finished, that would take you more than 30,000 years. Wow. If the first, <laughs> the first humans had arrived in North America, started counting when they crossed the Bering Straits, they'd be about halfway to a trillion. <laughs> it's a massive number, um, mm. like a really massive number. And that much money is being stolen every year and stashed in Moneyland, which means that Moneyland becomes that much wealthier every year. And that's a very troubling thought. Mm. <clears throat> it. it- it is, and as you say, it's 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 hard to wrap our heads around that amount of wealth. I think there's for for most of us, we just we just assume, okay, really wealthy, but we have no idea, no way of putting that into some sort of context, which creates, I, I guess, a bit of. Um, I, I don't know if it's indifference. I, I don't know if you, you talk about how we don't hear about this often enough. Is that is that a function of uh, the, the the media? Is that a function of um, our, our, our how divided we are? Is that how 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 does that uh, fit, factor into the, the the equation? Do you think? Well, I mean, I think the the problem is that this isn't a conspiracy. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not describing a sort of it's James Bond S. Yeah. Yeah, this is it, you know, there's no villain out there masterminding yeah. all this. This is baked into globalization. This is mm-hmm. essentially what happens when you 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 allow crooks access to a globalized financial system. I'm not saying globalization is bad necessarily, but but it but it's bad when crooks have unfettered access to it. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and and that makes it very hard to to do anything about, which is one reason why I think a lot of people have just turned off from this altogether, because, you know, why bother thinking about something if you can't do anything about it? But it's something I try to do with the book is explain that this isn't just a a thing about money. It isn't just money that goes offshore. You can put anything offshore. Mm -hmm. If, if you're a wealthy oligarch from the former Soviet Union or or anywhere, and you, and you decide to, to become a philanthropist in the UK, that means you can take advantage of British libel law and, and essentially, that means you can stop people writing about you because they're going to get sued in the UK and will be shut down. If you do that, then you have your reputation offshore. Um, if you put your children, uh, you know, at, at school in Switzerland or at college in the United States, then your children are offshore. Most extraordinarily, there's a whole new industry in which you can buy a passport. You know, if you are a wealthy Chinese person, for example, or, or a Malaysian or, a, a, you know, an Iraqi or a Sudanese person, it's very frustrating to have a, a passport that doesn't give you visa-free access to most of the world. So you can now put your citizenship offshore. You can buy, um, you know, a, a citizenship in, in there are five countries in the Caribbean and now um, four countries in Europe that will sell passports to people who, who want them. And, and so you're putting your citizenship offshore. In fact, as I describe in the book mm. with this, rather sort of blackly comic story of a, mm. of a Saudi billionaire called Walid al Jafali. You do, yes. Um, yeah. he, he's a man who bought it. He bought an ambassadorship in London. Mm. Um, you know, he, he, he wanted to avoid having to pay a divorce settlement to his supermodel ex-wife. Um, and so he bought himself an ambassadorship in London and, and claimed diplomatic immunity. And that, if you do that, you know, you've put everything offshore. It's not just your wealth and your reputation and and your children that are offshore. That that's your, your your everything. You are now legally immune from any kind of consequences. You know, so Moneyland is is about much more than just money. It's about everything, every form of privilege that that is essentially you know that can be obtained. You can put it offshore, and once you do that, then you're untouchable. And you can pick and choose which laws and which regulations to to obey. You can, you know, not pay taxes, but then have your kids educated in Switzerland or in Britain. So I mean, you, you I mean, just, it's a menu, right, of the best things across I mean, all of the different countries in the world. Well, that and that's the joy of it, because it's a function of the fact that that um, laws are national. You know, the the British police only can Im- can impose its writ within Britain. The same goes for the U.S. police in the U.S. and the Swiss police in Switzerland and so on. But money is international. 
So for most of us, we, we only really live in one country. We, we spend our time in one country. So this isn't really an issue that we think about. But if you're very wealthy, you, li- you can live transnationally. Your, your wealth is transnational. So essentially, if you're very wealthy, then borders cease to have any meaning. Um, so the, the people who are trying to keep tabs on you, who are trying to possibly prosecute you for wealth, they have to obey national borders. But the, pe- but, but the people they're pursuing, um, the very wealthy, the rich and unscrupulous citizens of Moneyland, they get to go wherever they like. They get to do whatever they like. And that is what Moneyland is. It's essentially a, a pick and mix um, approach to the legislation of the world or any jurisdiction that suits your interests at any particular period of time. Actually, perhaps it would be useful to maybe go through the different, you describe the different phases of stealing wealth, hiding it and spending it. And and it, it might be useful to just maybe walk through some of the, the high level mechanics of, of, of all of this, how wealth is stolen, then hidden and then and then spent on things like property and in, incredible houses in London and New York and things like that. Yeah, OK. But so it's the thing to remember. I mean, there have always been thieves and crooks. This isn't in that regard, that there's nothing new here. Um, you know, people have always abused their power, I think, as long as there's been power to abuse. I think that's probably pretty much certain. Um, but what's new is is the, the role of the international financial system and the ability it gives people to hide their wealth. Because once upon a time, if you stole money, the amount of money you could steal was kind of limited by where you could put it. You know, OK, you could you could build yourself a big house. You can steal a load of money. You can put it in all the rooms in your house. And then what are you going to do with it? You can give it away or you can have it eaten by mice. Or, but that's it, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're up against the sort of the, the physical limits of, of storing wealth. Um, the amazing power of the financial system is that it spirits wealth elsewhere, offshore, into a sort of magical transportation box where you don't have to worry about storing it anymore. And you don't have to worry about, you know, having to conf- confront your neighbors with it. You can live somewhere and not have to have your gigantic pile of wealth directly in front of them because your gigantic pile of wealth is is in London or New York or whatever. That's what Moneyland did. And 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 this is actually a relatively recent invention. You can trace it back to um, in a, a city, the city of London in, in the 1960s, in fact, 1962 to three, when they essentially created this um, um, instrument called the Euro bond, which basically allowed people to to, to have anonymous offshore wealth, which which paid them an income, uh, which hadn't hadn't existed before. It was a very you know radical invention, um, and it was that, that that set money free and that essentially made it very profitable to to dodge taxes and very profitable to steal money, um, and and that it's the the sort of the successes, the children of the euro bond, which are these anonymous offshore structures that you can use to hold property in such a way that your name isn't on it. That's what really is the scaffolding of Moneyland. Because Mm -hmm. if you can keep your name off something um, by using a company registered in Nevada or a a trust registered in Jersey or a a foundation registered in Liechtenstein, if you can keep your name off something, then essentially there's nothing to connect you to the crime you've committed. And that means you can spend as much as you like. So so essentially what Moneyland does for you is is if if you steal money and you want to spend it, before you spend it, you can hide it. Um, and you can hide your involvement in the in the crime. And that's the power of Moneyland. And, and the, that's the new aspect of all this is that you've always been able to steal and spend and you've always been able to steal and hide. But you weren't previously able to steal, hide and spend altogether. It's the it's the sort of Moneyland pathway that's beggaring the world. Mm-hmm. Could you talk a little bit about how tax havens work? And I, I found your your uh, description of your time in, in Nevis really interesting. For, for example, and how frustrating um, it, it, it was to just identify the you know, simple address for a company um, and, uh, and, and how that, how that, that works. It, I think it'd be uh, interesting for my listeners to, to hear about that. Yeah, because I mean, you know, there's, a, there's a, a very large demand from people who've got money to hide. And there's a very large demand from people who want to sell things. So, you know, if you can be... Um, you know, the node in between those two, if you can be the place that hides money, that can be a very profitable place to be. And, and obviously, this is essentially the core uh, business model of tax havens in, in throughout history. Places like Jersey, um, in, in Jersey, uh, in Britain, rather than Jersey in the US, um, places like Switzerland, obviously, places like Monaco, Vanuatu in the Pacific, and then a whole sp- sort of spray of islands 
in the Caribbean. And one of the reasons the Caribbean is so popular for this is because it has a lot of small jurisdictions and small jurisdictions, particularly island jurisdictions, are very prone to, to, to this industry because often they were British, so they have British law, so they can function very straightforwardly in communicating with the City of London. And also they speak English, which makes things nice and easy. And islands also just find it difficult to earn a living otherwise. So they like to, to take advantage of any scams that are going. And sort of the most egregious example I found is this island called Nevis, which is, uh, it's not a country, it's the junior half of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, St. Kitts and Nevis is, is mainly famous for selling passports. But Nevis has also um, has carved out a secondary role as a real bottom feeder of a tax haven. And this was... You know, it's it's a remarkable example of the extent to which, you know, tax havens enable thought, fraud and theft. You know, the, the former president of Taiwan's family owned property in the US, via, you know, Nevis vehicles. Uh, the president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, he had, um, you know, Nevis structures in his in his property empire. Um, you know, ma- multiple frauds, the, the, the flash crash of the Dow and what was that, 2010, that big, big fall in the Dow, that was um, the the proceeds went to Nevis, you know, scam after scam across America, across, uh, the, I, mean, I think the biggest ever tax fraud in the UK was again, traced back to Nevis. You know, it is a place that sells secrecy as a way of bolstering its national budget. And it does so very successfully. Um, but what's remarkable about it, if you go there, is how you'd never know. It's just, it's a very nice place. It's, you know, it's a little island, you know, kind of, beautiful beaches, beautiful palm trees. And it just has these office buildings that just do boring office stuff. It's the sort of the banality of evil encapsulated. You know, you can go into these places and there's just a, you know, a couple of lovely people at desks who are all just doing some kind of work that like anyone does in any office anywhere. It just so happens that what they're doing is beggaring the world. What's particularly amazing is that the laws of Nevis, which allow them to do this, and they're remarkable laws. I mean, you know, just to bring Bring a court case in Nevis if you if you if you're trying to challenge one of these structures. Just to bring a court case, you have to pay a bond of a hundred thousand <laughs> right. dollars, and that's before you even even begin. You know, cash down. You know that. I mean, that's tough for most people. Sure. Um, you know, but those laws were all written by American lawyers. Um, these are American lawyers in in you know all up the the West Coast and in, and and Florida in particular, who are very keen on securing you know, essentially an extra layer of protection for their clients. You know, those might be men getting divorced who don't want to pay a divorce settlement or or people who've, who've, you know, committed some form of fraud, medical malpractice, who don't want to end up losing their assets. And, you know, these so these laws were designed for Americans who wanted uh, protection from lawsuits. And then they've just been repurposed by crooks and kleptocrats and thieves from all over the world who, who want the same protection for themselves. Um, you know, but for even worse reasons, you know, in a way you might say that these laws were invented to protect naughty people. And now essentially they're being used to protect evil people instead. Um, and this is the, the story of Moneyland all the way through. Uh, these these instruments that are used to hide money tended to be invented originally to let Westerners dodge taxes. You know, and yes, you shouldn't dodge taxes, but it's not, you know, as crimes go, it's not murder. Um, right. But then. But then these same structures, these same instruments uh, are then used by you know, people like Vladimir Putin, people like, you know, the ruling family in, in China, r- ruling elite in China, people like that, in order to dodge money that they've stolen, in, you know, in, in, the, in the billions. And that's a real problem because, it, you know, then it starts undermining the stability of the entire world. Right. I mean, just to take one one country, I think you, you mentioned that over half of Russian wealth is is in this money land. Yeah, it's that that estimate comes from a a, a really um, interesting piece of research by Gabriel Zuckman, who's mm-hmm. a, an academic at the University of um, California in Berkeley, um, and he he's done uh, research into anomalies in international trade data um, because the, the you know this money it still exists the money which is in Moneyland it's 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 just that we can't see it so so you can see anomalies when when money goes out of a country but doesn't come into another country that's when things go into Moneyland and and. Um, and he's looked at those anomalies and he's estimated that, the, the, yeah, the former Soviet Union, Russia, the former Soviet Union, is 52 percent of all money is offshore, all household wealth. So more than half of all the money in the country, um, you know, for the for the countries of the Gulf and the Arab world, it's about 60 percent. So three three fifths of all the money in the country for sub, sub in, in that area for sub-Saharan Africa, it, it's it's more than 40 percent. So these are serious numbers. You know, if you if you think about. You know, if, for example, I'm not saying this is likely to happen, but were there to be some form of revolution in in Russia and a and a and a wonderful public spirited, 
um, friendly government were to come into being who cared more about the well-being of its own citizens and less about getting rich for itself, it would instantly lose access to half of all the money in the country because mm-hmm. half of that money belongs to the current elite. You know, this is a real problem. Um, and, it, and it really stymies prospects of democratic transformation. We've seen this in, in Ukraine. They had... Um, they had the revolution, what, four years ago now, more than four years ago, and the government has still not managed to confiscate and to return to state ownership the palace that Yanukovych built for himself on land that he stole from the government. You know, the signature achievement of the revolution was was taking over this palace and keeping it safe for the people, and they've still not managed to return that to state ownership. That's how well protected it is by money land. And right. it's, a, it's, you know, it's an astonishingly difficult system to go up against. Right. And th- this is certainly not unique to the Ukraine. I mean, the, the, the Marcos is in the, in the Philippines. Um, they, the, when, when was that? Uh, 1986. And they still haven't tracked down all the wealth that, um, that the Marcos allegedly stole from the public coffers. I think one of the most astonishing examples is Pavlo Lazarenko. So going back to Ukraine, but, but this is, it has a U.S. Mm. angle. Pavlo Lazarenko was the prime minister of Ukraine. He fled for un- slightly unexplained reasons, possibly because he hadn't really thought it through. He fled to the US in 1999 um, and claimed asylum, which was unwise because it meant that he was then held in custody and could be prosecuted. He was prosecuted for corruption and he had his, his mansion in California taken away from him. But what was amazing was it was that was almost exactly two decades ago that he was first arrested. And yet even the US, the most sort of fearsome and diplomatically powerful law enforcement system in the world still hasn't managed to confiscate the money that he had in in other jurisdictions antigua and guernsey and places like that right so you know it's just so leaving aside you know that case if you look at somewhere like nigeria if it's trying to regain control of assets that have been stolen argentina uh, malaysia you know afghanistan you know any country you name it has been suffering this problem really it's very very hard if not impossible to regain control of money once it's been stolen and stashed in money land. In fact, um, if you look at the figures, it's, it's sort of probably, it's less, certainly less than a cent for every hundred dollars that's stolen, almost certainly less than a cent for every thousand dollars that's stolen that's ever recovered in return to the people it was stolen from. Right. One of the things that surprised me about the book was the, the depth, uh, the, the depth through which uh, one can, Use vehicles in the United States of all of all places to um, to carry out this uh, this type of activity as well. Yeah, I mean the U.S. has it has a sort of bit of a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde situation. And mm. The enforcement in the U.S. is very good, um, far better than it is anywhere else. Um, but regulation is absolutely awful, um, far worse than it is in any comparable European country. Um, and this is because so many of the states have been making money for decades, if not centuries. Um, so certainly decades, undercutting each other by selling, you know, anonymity. So, I mean, it started off with New York started, um, you know, having limited liability companies and then and then New Jersey undercut New York and then Delaware undercut New Jersey. And now sort of Nevada is undercutting Delaware and South Dakota is undercutting Nevada and Wyoming is undercutting South Dakota. And so you have this endless race to the bottom. Um, and you can, you know, studies of, you know, the worst places, the places that do the least checks when you establish a company and incorporate a company. You know, the, the U.S. comes bottom on every single scale. It, it's astonishingly bad. Um, you know, way, way, way worse than the Caribbean tax havens, for example. Um, and, and uh and and this is is something which which has become increasingly problematic in the post financial crisis world because um, a lot of the stolen offshore money was hidden in Switzerland before, but 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 the United States in the Obama administration was very cross with Switzerland and 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 really put a lot of pressure on it until Switzerland backed down and agreed to stop doing this. And then where did the money go? It didn't go back to the places where it was stolen from. It went to the United States because. The, the United States forces other countries to tell it where, you know, their, which of its citizens have money in their banks. But but it doesn't reciprocate. It doesn't doesn't return the favor by telling other countries if their citizens have money in the U.S. So so essentially the, the best place to put your money now, if you're a, you know, a foreign kleptocrat is, is in a trust in South Dakota or Wyoming or Nevada. Um, you know, and the, the trust industry in South Dakota since the financial crisis has increased in size from the assets it holds has increased from about $40 billion to $250 billion. And that's just in one state. Um, you know, so it has become the, the United States It's no exaggeration to say is now the new tax haven. Jeez. And previously, previously efforts against tax havens have been largely led by the U S and the EU. 
Um, and obviously the US isn't going to, I mean, it's not able to do anything against Nevada because Nevada has its own competencies to, to do things in its own way. So who's going to do that? So, you know, we're in a, in a, in a particularly dark place at the moment. And, but this is a function of Moneyland because Moneyland has no loyalty to any one jurisdiction. You know, if, mm-hmm. if the money in Moneyland is, is suddenly starts being treated badly in Jersey or Switzerland or Nevis or wherever, then it'll just go somewhere else. Um, you know, and, and because it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a sort of endlessly mutating um, thing. So it's sort of in the cloud. So that that's why it's currently you know moving to places like Nevada and South Dakota, because that's where it's being treated best. And we're talking about something that is fundamentally different from, say, the the ease of doing business, which, you know, the World Bank talks about um, where it sets out this ease of doing business index or governance indicators. And that's um, that that's that's one thing in terms of how easy or difficult it is to set up a business. But we're, we're talking about uh, not really setting up businesses. We're talking about things like trusts and shell companies and um, and those types of things. So is there is there a. Um, uh, an, an important um, was there a correlation between say ease of doing business and the ability to um to, to hide to hide wealth I mean, partly i'm i'm not talking about in the book i don't talk at all about you know companies like apple who are mm-hmm. abusing you know the 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 island tax system in order to not pay taxes in the us or companies like vodafone have done the same in the uk you know um this is a book about crooks and thieves individuals who've, who've abused the system but there are aspects of that that doing business survey, um, one aspect of it is that one of the, the 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 things they take into account when they say how easy it is to do business in your country is how easy it is to create a company. Yeah. Um, now, creating a shell company is absolutely crucial to um, to kleptocracy to Moneyland. It is that that is the structure around money, which which Moneyland is built because that's what allows you to hide your money. You've stolen it, you hide it via a shell company, and then you spend it. Um, and it is a problem that the World Bank says that essentially the easier it is to create a company, the better. Now, I mean, in the UK, for example, it's been made astonishingly easy to create companies. It costs just £13, which is about, what, $16. Um, and you can do it in about 15 minutes. You don't have to be in the UK. You don't have to really identify yourself in any particular way. And this this means that the companies have become, you know, the, the vehicles of choice for for money laundering, particularly out of Eastern Europe. There was a scandal um, last month in related to Danske Bank, a Danish bank, particularly their branch in Estonia, um, which was, you know, the probably the biggest money laundering scandal in history. You know, volume of money moved sort of 250 times bigger than HSBC moved out of Mexico. Um, you know, and the single biggest group of account holders in Danske Bank's Estonia branch were British shell companies. Mm. Yet, and yet the government here does absolutely nothing about this because they say it's too expensive. You know, so thousands of millions, you know, billions, that is, of, of pounds are being stolen from the former Soviet Union. And yet, you know, the UK com- government isn't prepared to do anything about it because it says it'll cost us hundreds of millions of pounds. So, you know, the benefit would be a thousand times bigger than the cost. And yet we're still not prepared to do that. And so that is a real problem. And I think actually this this idea that the easier you make it to incorporate, the, the better than that, that is a profoundly wrong idea, mm. because, you know, essentially you know, incorporating yourself and acting via a company when all you want to hide your stolen fraud. It's just state sponsored identity fraud. That's all it is. Um, and yet we're pretending it's something else. And this isn't what companies are created for. Companies are created to, to encourage entrepreneurship. They're not supposed to encourage fraud. And, you know, and that's something that, that we really should be doing something about. And to be honest, it's encouraging that that um, certainly in, in the UK, there's a big push towards towards making this t- harder to do. And in the U.S. now, there is as well There's a, a group called the FACT Coalition in the U.S. who have been doing some really good work bringing together all different stakeholders from NGOs, from um, the banking sector, from big business. Even the Secretary of State of Delaware has now signed up saying that he wants mm. companies to record their true owners. You know, so that's good. And, you know, so we're moving in the right direction, but we've got a really long way to go. Right. Could we talk a little bit about the role of the, the so-called enablers of all of this, the bankers, the accountants, the consultants? Etc. In the lawyers in 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 Western um, countries, where their 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 role is to, or there's there is an industry of um, of helping the kleptocrats hide their hide their wealth. What what uh, what are your thoughts on on that? So say for example the the big four accounting firms um, or um, or big law firms that that work with some of these 
individuals as clients? Um, well, the thing is that it's very hard to persuade someone of the course of action of a course of action if if it's going to cost them. I think that's just a sort of a, a basically a broad principle across all of human history. <clears throat> and a whole industry has grown up, particularly in London and New York, but in other cities too, um, that has essentially servicing the interests of the rich and unscrupulous. I mean, you know, obviously these are people who real estate agents who sell, you know, high end condos in New York or, ta- or you know, mansions in London to crooks from from wherever, from the former Soviet Union, from wherever. Um, you know, obviously, you know, they're the sort of the, the kind of most unacceptable face of it. But it's not just them. It's the PR agents who launder their reputations. It's the accountants who structure their businesses. It's the lawyers who, who sue journalists on their behalf. You know, all of these professionals are enabling the fraud and the theft that is beggaring the world. Um, you know, there was an astonishing piece of research by a global witness, um, I think three or two years ago, in which they they went to a, a number of lawyers in New York and essentially presented themselves as acting on behalf of an African mm. kleptocrat and said, would you help us hide our money so we can spend it in the U- US? And only one of the lawyers told them no. The others all started suggesting ways that this could be done. And, they, and you know, and the global witness had got this all on camera. So we, we know what happened. Um, you know, and that was a really telling example of how the, the sort of morals of, of our professions have, have really failed to keep up with with the economy as we, you know that they, are, they you know that a lot of what they're doing is legal because these are the people who write the laws but it's very definitely immoral how, how do we stop this what, what 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 are some of the things that we should think about doing in order to cut uh, perhaps we can never stop it but at least to cut down on this type of activity I mean, the key thing, and I, and I see this again and again and again when I talk to law enforcement professionals who are, who are in, in this world trying to do something about this, the key thing is to imp- introduce transparency of ownership. You know, mm-hmm. again, I've, I go back to say, what, what is a company supposed to be for? You know, essentially, if you have a limited liability company, you are, you are basically, in, you, the, the whole of society is the risk of your business venture because your business venture – <clears throat> is deemed to be good for society. This is a way of encouraging entrepreneurs. So it's a form of insurance. But no one gets to have insurance anonymously. That's crazy. You don't get to insure a house and not tell an insurance company who you are. But that's basically what's happening. We're, you know, Anonymous shell companies are essentially a form of socialized risk for the entirety of society. The benefit is entirely for the owner of the company. And they don't even have to say who they are. I mean, this is you know, way, way, way beyond what the creators of companies originally intended them to be for. So we need to go back to a time when if you create a company, you have to say who you are. And if and there are people out there in the world, you know, Hollywood film stars or, you know, victims of domestic violence or whoever, these are people who deserve to have anonymity and need to have anonymity. But that anonymity should be provided to everyone who needs it, not to people who could who could afford it. Um, you know, and it's it, that those two things should be broken out apart. Companies and anonymity should have nothing to do with each other. And that's that's an absolutely crucial step. I mean, there's one uh, law, a federal law enforcement uh, uh, agent I spoke to in Miami uh, who told me that half of his time is spent trying to work out who owns what, you know, which means that if there were if there was um, transparency of ownership, he could do twice as many investigations. It's an astonishing figure. Um and I heard that repeated all across, you know, across different countries, across different agencies. That's just a normal thing for them to say. Um, so right. absolutely, the transparency of ownership is crucial. And you will, this will, you will meet a lot of opposition from very wealthy Westerners who don't like paying taxes. But it's really important that that's overcome because because it's never going to be easier to secure this than it is right now. Mm-hmm. What What do you think? You, you mentioned global witness, but um, what about other? people what other members of civil society i mean how how strong is civil society around this area because it doesn't it that, that's perhaps another another thing that that needs to happen so that we get more awareness i, I it's quite strong here in the uk sure okay. um, i think um there's a growing i think because because of london's possibly unique role or not quite unique but but <laughs> certainly world leading role in enabling the theft of the world we're also quite good at, at being aware of this so you know obviously global witness uh, transparency international corruption watch a number of other 
groups have been very good at this. Um, it's it there isn't quite I don't think the the prominence in the United States as there is here. <clears throat> but I mentioned the Fact Coalition earlier. Um, there are also um, other you know groups in in Washington, the, uh, the Kleptocracy Initiative at Hudson Institute, and various others who are doing some really valuable work in this area as well. So it's it's taking off there. And in Paris, there is some some very imaginative work being done by a group called Sherpa doing sort of legal work against kleptocrats. So, I, you know, civil society is doing quite well. But I think really the place that I've been, which has got the, had the most extraordinary civil society, has achieved the most remarkable results has been Ukraine, mm. where amazingly brave activists stood up to a really grotesque government and, and faced it down and have, and have achieved some you know, not everything they wanted, but have achieved some really impressive wins ever since, particularly in the sphere of reducing corruption in the purchase of medicine that made it much easier to buy medicine, you know, at a reasonable mm-hmm. price now when it was really tough before. So, you know, you know, to be honest, we could all learn a few lessons from, from Kiev right now. Right, right. Um, th- that is uh, that that is interesting. And uh, you also, I, I think, talk about the, the relationship between all of this and um, the populism that we're that we're experiencing right now um in in and across the the globe uh, brazil i suppose being the the latest example um and the the threats to to democracy you, you one of you, you talk about the ukraine obviously the um the the the, the crimea crimea annexation um that that uh, that occurred uh one could attribute directly to um to to, to kleptocracy what where, where, where do you see where do you see some of the biggest risks to um, to, to the world in which we live and uh, and to democracy? Uh, what, 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 are you optimistic, pessimistic, uh, indifferent? What what uh, what is your what is your sense of things right now? I think the problem we're facing, the money land problem, is an inherently transnational one. The problem is created by the fact that the very that the rich and unscrupulous are able to hide their money anywhere they like, any country in the world. Um, You know, and that is the the core problem, that that, that their wealth is treated better than the rest of us are. Um, And any movement that seeks to put up barriers and prevent international cooperation in the campaign against this wealth is therefore a problem. You know, what we need is more international cooperation between, you know, the the countries of the EU or the countries of the OECD or, or the G7 or whatever, not less. So any any political movement, and I'm thinking here obviously of, of President Trump and of Brexit, but not just them. Also, we see Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, the, the Polish government, the Turkish government. <clears throat> any movement that seeks to essentially erect walls against people, but not against money, is is a is a movement that is inherent inherently harmful. Because the problem is not immigrants without money. The problem is immigrants with money. Um, they're the ones who are undermining our systems. You know, and and these sort of fear mongering about you know refugees, the refugees are essentially being driven out of their countries like Syria or, or or Ukraine or the countries of Central America because those countries have been so badly looted that they're falling apart. You know, and yet they're, so then we're welcoming their money here, but we're not welcoming the people here. You know, so that if we really want these immigrants not to turn up in countries then we need to to help them solve their countries at home. These people don't want to leave home. They want to stay at home. <clears throat> Everyone wants to stay at home. Um, you know, but that, that if we, if, and if we're going to help them improve their countries, we need to stop it helping their government steal money and stop accepting that stolen cash. So, so to my mind, we need more transnational cooperation and let, not less, which means that sadly for me, that the, the phenomenon of President Trump and the phenomenon of Brexit are, are inherently harmful, which is very ironic because I think a lot of the people, not all of by a long shot, but a lot of the people who voted for President Trump and voted for Brexit did so because they were essentially complaining about money land. They were complaining about international, the international elite complaining about a sort of, you know, feeling that they would be able to take back control from these kind of unaccountable, you know, rulers that, that they had. And, and actually, they've ended up doing something which which will just perpetuate the problem, which is a shame. Sure. And, and the, it, it's such a structurally, it's so difficult because all it takes is a few jurisdictions uh, through which one can can do this. That's absolutely right. But but, you know, again, that that's that that that's not 
we that's something we could change it would be quite easy mm-hmm. to say you, you can't own property in in the uk or, or in or in the us or switzerland or wherever you can't own property anonymously you have to declare who owns it in mm-hmm. fact britain is doing that though i'm you know it's it's not for a little while it's not for another two years um and and if you do that it doesn't really matter if you own your property through nevis anymore because you won't have obtained the anonymity that you're relying on um so so it, it is in our power in in the sort of the wealthy countries of the west to do something about this um it's it, it someone like nigeria or afghanistan you know they're, they're they're already doomed you know they need our help to solve this problem but fortunately we're in the fortunate position of being able to solve it on our own um and and i you know i'm i really think that you know i'm hoping that if, if moneyland achieves anything it will be to to show people that the problem is is in the west um, and that corruption is, is, is not just about where the victim is, but also where the culprit is. And if the culprit is here, then, then we need to solve that problem here. And, and if we do that, then maybe corruption you know, won't, won't exist to nearly the same scale as it does at the moment. Well, that, that's, that's quite a positive note, because it, as, as individual citizens, it, it means that you know, through, our, through our democracy, we can, we can do something about that. I mean, we can lobby our representatives, we can, um, we, we can raise awareness of the issue and, and, and so forth. So in, you know, in, some, in some respects, what you, as you say, what, you, um, what you're writing about is um, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's very important to identify the, the problem as you do. So, um, oh, yeah, I mean, you know, just so a, a brief, a brief anecdote. So I mentioned earlier that, that Ukrainians got good at campaigning on medical corruption. Um, after the revolution in Ukraine, um, it took a, took a real arm wrestle, but they got there in the end. Um, they took medicine procurement away from the corrupt officials who've been running it and the corrupt Ukrainian companies, and they gave it to two UN agencies and one British not for profit company. Um, those those three international bodies ran procurement on their behalf and instantly cut prices for medicines being paid by the Ukrainian government by 40 percent, four zero. Um, that all that most exactly the same medicines. There's no difference in the quality, no difference in in any form. They were the same medicines being bought from the same factories, but they got them for 40 percent cheaper just because they weren't corrupt. You know, and that and that is a win. You know, and you can these small sort of seeming technical improvements can achieve absolutely massive massive results you know again we saw this with um when fincen states started insisting that the companies that were buying cash purchases of, of of property in um in uh not where in the us but in the major markets in miami dade in, in la and new york and other places that the cash purchases of property via um shell companies had to declare their true owner and we saw that these purchases just drop off a cliff right. you know so these these the small changes can have a massive result uh, and, you know, so it's, it, you know, it's not a question of making the world perfect immediately, but even a small change can 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 shift the dial in the direction of, you know, the good guys. And, that, you know, that's, yeah, that's a positive thought. Right. Uh, no, absolutely. W- was there anything that surprised you in the course of researching this, uh, this, th- this book? Um, I was very surprised to discover the U.S. role um, yeah. in, in per- perpetuating Moneyland, particularly in its latest iteration you know i, I suppose I'll, i i'd been very aware of the sort of villainous nature of 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 the uk and particularly it's 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 network of tax havens for a long time but i was surprised to discover that the us was at this um and i suppose i suppose the, the lesson is that, that that everyone is really there are very few countries in the world possibly i know bhutan possibly and that's it that aren't involved in this one way or another it, it's a it's a true global network in which money is being sucked out of you know the likes of China and ending up in the likes of the U.S. with the active connivance of the political class in both countries, and and that means it's a very hard thing to do something about. You know, I suppose I, I hoped that in writing the book, um, well, I, I suppose it's, well, this is a silly way of putting it, but a little bit of me hoped that someone would stand up at one of the events I do or would write me an email and say, you know what, I understand why you think that way, but you're wrong. Actually, it's fine. We've really got out, we've, we're really getting on top of this. Um, you know, because it's such a depressing thought, the idea that, that, that essentially there's this sort of unaccountable wealth running around the world and that, that we're really un- unable to do anything about it. Um, but in fact, the opposite has happened. I've had emails from from law enforcement professionals from all sorts of places just saying, well, I'm really glad someone's finally written about this because you know, no one's noticed this for so long. So, you know, it, it's, it is bad, um, but, but being aware of it is, you know, is, is, a, is the first step towards recovery. So, you know, we're, we're kind of on our way now. 
you've done a fine job. I mean, an excellent job in, in, in laying it out in this, in this book. And it's, it's such a, 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 it's also a colorful read because you know you you love to I, I it's always fascinating to me to read about um, just the the extraordinary extraordinary uh, whether it's homes or lifestyles of, of some of these uh, some of these individuals and um, and and it, it really brings it all brings it all home because without without that it, it's all sort of nebulous you know yeah there's a whole bunch of rich people and there always will be and I, there's nothing I can do about it that's kind of I think the default position that most of us walk around with so it's yeah, yeah. I mean it's, it's it's essentially a depressing story I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hide that but I had a lot of fun um, coming up with fun ways of telling it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the most the most fun I had was structuring the entire chapter around an episode of Say Yes to the Dress, uh, the reality television show, um, just because, um, you know, it's an utterly daft program about women buying wedding dresses and generally having, you know, family dramas and then ending up happy. And the fact that that essentially you could use an episode of this to demonstrate the fact that the you know an entire segment of our economy is is open to anyone with money, no matter where that money comes from. Because in this, in one of the episodes, you know, the daughter of an Angolan politician, a high-ranking Angolan politician, had spent two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on wedding dresses for herself and her bridesmaids and her mother. You know, that was a pretty fun way of telling that story. And I and I hope that if you read that chapter, you have a laugh on reading it. You know, it is it's inherently depressing, but also it's kind of funny. And that's the thing, because a lot of the, a lot of this is, it, you know, it's black humor, right? You, you've got to, you didn't, you, you have to laugh with it a bit. Otherwise, you sort of more or less give up. Um, so, no, I mean, I think it's I think the book is, yeah, it's depressing and it's worrying. And if you if it doesn't make you angry, you're probably not paying attention. But but it also, you know, hopefully it'll make you laugh as well. Yeah. And I suppose people who don't spend any time in London don't live in 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 London um it, it's uh it, it, it's it's important to it's important for that, for for while it's important for all of us but you know you walk around london and you see these places like one hyde park and uh um these mansions and and, and so forth and it's just uh, it's extraordinary it's just not, it's 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 unbelievable the the amount of wealth that's just under right under our noses um, my, my my personal favorite is dmitry firtash the ukrainian oligarch who um uh, bought himself a mansion yeah, in, in West London, uh, just down the road from Harrods for 60 million pounds. Yeah. Um, and then that wasn't really enough. So he bought the neighboring tube station. Yeah. For another 53 right. million pounds. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're like, yeah, for a man who has everything, a tube station. You know, yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty extraordinary. It, it is. Yeah. And uh, it, it's 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 a little bit more you know it's it's still in your in, you're not quite in your face in london but it's you know if you um if you if you anywhere in the, that sort of in the west end or um around kensington or uh, uh near harrods or you know just seeing lamborghinis on the street and you know just the the, the shops and whether it's the you know the, the mclaren was it the mclaren shop on the ground floor of of um of of one hyde park um it it's you, you you it's clear these there are, there's a different universe here <laughs> i mean there's two there's there's two rolex shops on opposite sides of the street you know yeah. you can't be bothered to cross the road to buy a rolex right, that's right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's pretty amazing yeah it, it is it is um I, we, we covered quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of ground uh were, th- were were there any other aspects of moneyland that um that we didn't get a chance to to explore that you you wanted to mention no, I think I think that's pretty much all of it. I mean, I'm you know I think it's it's um, yeah it's it, as I say. I mean, the, it, it's it's in our hands to do something about it. I think that's the main message that that, I, that I'd hope that people would would take away from the book. You know, it's 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 bad and it's being, but but it you know we can help and it's something we can solve. Yeah, and, and uh, I think that's that's a great place to you know, to, to sort of wrap it up because as you say you, you we, we can get very uh, despairing about the state of the world but um, and if you link all of this stuff back to where things are on on brexit and uh, you know if one one thinks that populism isn't a, isn't a good thing then well this is you know there are some levers for us to um to to perhaps uh, um, get our uh, you know to truly get our countries back or may make our countries great again perhaps absolutely I, I quite agree Oliver I really appreciate 
your uh, taking the time to speak to me. Uh, was could, could before we go, um, where can my listeners follow you and find you and get a copy of the book? Well, I'm I'm on I'm on Twitter um, at Oliver Bullo. I spend probably too much time there. Um, uh, the the book has been released in the UK. It came out in September. Published by Profile, um, available at all good bookshops, obviously, and on Amazon.co.uk. It will be released in the US in May, um, published by St. Martin's Press. I'm just finishing up some little extra bits for the US edition now. Um, any Dutch, Polish, or Turkish speaking, we're currently doing Dutch, Polish, and Turkish translations, and we're in negotiations to do some other countries issues but we haven't signed those contracts yet and we i am going to record an audio version in january okay um so that'll be out at some point in the new year but but at the moment that's um that's all there is that's fabulous that's uh, no that's that's great oliver thank you so much for being on the show I really appreciate thank you for it. having I me wish you all the best okay cheers bye for now I found that incredibly fascinating, and I hope that you did too. And by the way, Oliver used to run these kleptocracy tours of London, where you could go and visit the outside of the homes purchased by these kleptocrats. And while he's not running these tours any longer, you can visit all the places. Oliver has some YouTube videos on the topic, and if you find yourself in London or if you live here, you can do a little mini kleptocracy tour. Links to this and everything else that we covered are in the show notes. And we've got one more episode to go in 2018. It'll be out in seven days on the 31st. That will be a look back at 2018 and some of the biggest risks of 2019. So don't miss it. And make sure you subscribe to All Things Risk. Simply go to allthingsrisk.co.uk. That's .co. UK, and you can find every way in which you can do that. That's all. Happy holidays and speak to you next week. And in the interim, don't forget, risk is life.